Hi, welcome back to Educator.com's AP Music Theory class, and today's lesson is on intervals. So the objectives for this lesson are to learn interval spellings and qualities, and after that we're going to learn how to apply what we learned in the key signatures lesson to find intervals, and lastly we're going to do a little work with um, inverting intervals at the end of the lesson. So, a little definition of intervals. Uh, basically, an interval is the measurement of distance between two pitches. And these two pitches can occur in two different ways, harmonically or melodically. For instance, if I write, if I notate a D here and an F here, so the interval is going to tell us this distance between the two. And in this case, this would be a melodic interval because the notes are happening one after, the, uh, one after another, like a melody. And of course, to do a harmonic example would be maybe an interval of an A to an E here uh, happening simultaneously. So this would be an example of a harmonic interval. And this one here is melodic. Okay, so of course there's different kinds of intervals, and the simplest way we can classify them is by using numbers. So if I notate a C major scale here, we can see the different numbers available to us by finding the intervals all from this root note of C. So a C to a D, of course, is going to be some kind of second. So, right second here, and C to an E will be some kind of third, and C to this F will be a fourth, and so on. So it goes on from fifth, sixth, seventh, and C to C is, of course, uh, what we call an octave, not uh, eighth. And one more thing that's missing from this would be, of course, a C going to a C in the same line. So this is a unison. So these are the numbers that are available to us when we're naming intervals. And of course, we can have notes that are farther apart than an octave, uh, which would be called a compound interval. For instance, if we have the C going to this D here, we could call this a ninth, but we could also call it a compound second. And so on for all the other notes that are uh, bigger than an octave away from C. And it's not uncommon to see ninths and tenths called ninths and tenths, but beyond that you'll see compound fourth, compound fifth, uh, things like that. Okay. And now on to interval spellings. So we saw in the last example that in a C major scale, the note C to the note D is some sort of a second. And the idea here with spelling is to know that there's always going to be the number of the interval will always tell you the note name of the second note of the interval. For instance, if I want to go from this D here to, and I say give me a third above that, it will always be some kind of F. Now we don't know if it's going to be, you know, this F natural here or some kind of F sharp or even F double sharp or something, but it will never be, for instance, this F sharp, you know, on the piano could be written as a G flat, but that will not be a third from D since any D to any sort of G will of course be a one, two, three, some kind of fourth. So even though the point with the spellings uh, here is that even though F sharp and G flat are the same notes on the keyboard, uh, depending on what letter names we're using is going to depend, is going to determine the number of the interval. So a C to a D will always be some kind of second, a C to an E will always be some kind of third, and Vice versa, if someone's asking you for, let's say, 
a seventh above this f here, you know, even if we haven't figured out yet what kind of seventh it is or what accidentals we may need, but the one thing we know for sure is that it's going to be some sort of e because one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh note above f is e. Okay, so now let's talk about interval qualities now that we've covered the uh, numerical sizes. So, and to do that, I'm going to draw our trusty C major scale again. And I'm doing this because uh, with all of these music ideas, it's important, I think, to build upon what uh, we've learned already. And so we've learned about scales and key signatures, so why not use that knowledge to give us fluency with intervals instead of having a whole new system for learning everything from the ground up. So we saw in C major that these sizes here are second, everything from C of course, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and octave. I'll make that here. So, and now we're going to talk about qualities of these intervals. So, in the major scale, uh, all the these notes, the second, the third, the sixth, and the seventh are all going to be major intervals. So, in the major scale, so second, third sixth and seventh are major. So we'll call them major second, major third, major sixth, major seventh, so on. And the other intervals that I left out, the fourth, the fifth, and the octave, those qualities are called perfect. So we have, and of course the unison as well. So unison, fourth, fifth, and octave are perfect intervals. Okay, and we're going to contrast this C major scale to a C minor scale, and I'll draw it over here. So C, D, E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, C. Of course, you can write it like this, or you can write in the key signature here. And so now we have a few different quality of intervals. Of course, we know the C to the D hasn't changed, so that's still a major second. But the C to the E flat is now a minor third. And the fourth and fifth are the same. Those are still perfect fourth and fifth. But C to A flat, since it's being lowered, is a minor sixth. And of course, B flat is half step lower than a B. So this is a minor seventh and the other perfect intervals are all the same, of course. So this information is going to help us when we need to find intervals above certain notes, because if we can think of any note as the beginning of a major or minor scale, then knowing the key signature will help us to determine what interval, you know, what the note and the accidental are above that note for the given interval. So in addition to major, minor, and perfect intervals, there are augmented and diminished intervals. And those occur when we take any either a major or minor interval or a perfect interval and make it bigger or smaller. So let's take that C to D major second that we had in those two scales. So this is a major second. And we can see here that going from C to D is a whole step. And let's say. I change this by taking the D up a half step to a D sharp. And now we've already learned that it wouldn't be correct to call this a minor third because it's still a C to a D. So what do we call this? Uh, we're going to call it an augmented second, since going up higher than major by any step is going to be augmenting the interval. Similarly, if we lower this D and make it a D flat, 
that takes us to a minor second. And if we lower it again to D double flat, now we have a diminished second. And of course, this is getting sort of theoretical now, since a D double flat on the piano is, of course, just an harmonic with C. So we can make this little chart to help us remember interval sizes and what to call them. So we have minor and major here going to augmented and diminished here. And then we have the perfect intervals, which also become augmented and diminished as they get smaller or larger. OK, so let's take a look at how we can use our key signature knowledge to find some intervals. Let's say we start with the root note of an E, and someone's asking for a major third above an E. So we know from the major scale that uh, the third above C in C major is always a major third. So we need to find the corresponding third above in an E major scale. So we can either use our uh, scale patterns that we know to construct an E major scale, or we can go to our key signatures in the circle of fifths and know that E major has four sharps, which means that, and we're looking for a third above, so just do this. So now when we know of course, we know that any third above E is a G sharp, and it was a major third. And now that we're in E major, we know that E is going to a G sharp, and that is going to be the major third. Uh, let's do another example in this same key. So what if we want a perfect fifth above an E? So we simply count up five. One, two, three, four, five, and that gives us a B. And checking the signature, we see that it's just a B natural. So a B above an E gives us a perfect fifth. And last example in this key. So if you have the note E and someone's asking for a major seventh, So of course, you would count up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 to D. And checking the signature, we see that it is a D sharp. And that is a major seventh above E. <clears throat> so let's do some in minor now. So what if our root note is now D? And the question is asking for maybe a minor third above. So we can go to our minor key signatures, and we know that D minor has one flat. And so when we write a third above the D, we have an F, and there's nothing in the key signature, so that means that D to F is a minor third. And what if we want a minor sixth above D? So we would say one, two, three, four, five, six. And that gives us a B, which is, of course, a B flat. So D to B flat is a minor sixth. And last example for D minor, let's say a minor seventh. So same procedure, counting up seven. We get to a C, and we know from the signature that it's a C natural. So D to C is a minor seventh. OK, so what about the situation where we're st the starting note that we have doesn't conveniently become the uh, root note of a scale? So what if we're starting with D sharp, for instance, and we want a major third above a D sharp? OK, so what we can do for that is just add an extra step in between. So we'll make that D sharp a D natural and pretend like we're in D major for now since we want a major third above and we know that in major key the third is major. So, oops, that's not an F sharp. 
So then we write in our key signature for D major, which is two sharps. And that lets us know that this F should be an F sharp. And now we need to go back and make this work for D sharp. So all that means is we're going to raise both of these notes. So take the D and make it a D sharp. And this is already an F sharp. So now it becomes an F double sharp. And so now we know that a major third above D sharp is a, an F double sharp. So it's the same process. It still uses our knowledge of key signatures, but there's one step that we need to do in between to make it work. Let's do one more example of that in minor. So what about if we start with the note G flat? And the question is asking for a minor sixth above. So we can go ahead and make this G flat a G natural. And then go to our minor key signatures. And we know that it has two flats, G, na uh, G minor, so B flat and E flat. And now we write the sixth above, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and E, which is an E flat because of the key signature. So now we need to lower these both by a half step to get it back into G flat. So G becomes G flat, and this E flat becomes E double flat, and this is now a minor sixth above G flat. OK, and the last topic to cover for this lesson is inverting intervals. So there is a procedure where if we have an interval, like let's say an A to a C, oftentimes a question will ask, uh, what do you get when you raise or lower one of these by an octave, making an inversion? So for instance, if I take this C down an octave, this is, of course, some kind of third. But if I rewrite it with the C down here, it becomes some kind of sixth. And what we'll see with inversions is that they always add up to 9. So you can make this chart where an octave will become a unison, a seventh will become a second, sixth, third, fifth, fourth, fourth, fifth, and so on. So for instance, we can use this chart to help us if I have a second here and I decide I want to move this A up an octave. I can look at the chart and I know that it's going to become a seventh right here. And I'll do it just to check. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There it is. And the thing that's missing from this is the qualities. And there's a similar kind of relationship happening with the qualities. So a major interval inverted will always become a minor interval, and vice versa, minor, major. Perfect will always stay perfect, and let's see, a augmented interval will become diminished, and a diminished interval will become augmented. So for instance, let's look at this A to this C, which is, in this case, a minor third. And here we see it becoming this major sixth because, of course, it's part of the root note is C. And so looking back at the major scale, we know that the sixth in that scale is going to be major. So we have a minor third changing to a major sixth. OK, now let's practice a few uh, problems that you might encounter. So for first practice, let's find some major intervals using our key signature knowledge. So let's start with the note F and find a perfect fourth above F. So of course we know that in F the key signature is one flat and we're going to go a fourth above which is going to be some kind of B and we see that it is being affected by this key signature so we know that a perfect fourth above F is B flat. And let's choose a different note. What about going up a step to G? And 
the question is going to ask for, let's say, a major seventh above G. So we know, again, key signature for G is one sharp, right on F sharp, and that happens to correspond with the seventh note of the scale. So we know that a major seventh above G is an F sharp. And last example in major, we can do another one in E major. And let's find a major sixth above E. So from before, we saw the key signature is four sharps, F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, D sharp. And we'll count up six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we see that it's a C above, and not only that, but a C sharp. So C sharp above E is a major sixth. So now let's do the same thing in minor for more practice. So what if we need a minor third above an F? So we can think about an F minor scale, where the third is, of course, going to be minor above the root. So the key signature for that is four flats, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat. And when we draw in the A, we see that it's going to be an A-flat. So there's the answer for that. And let's do a octave above, let's be an E. And of course, an octave is going to be a perfect octave. It doesn't really make a difference whether we're in minor or major. So if just for fun we wanted to think about it in E minor, just to practice the key signature, we would draw in the signature of one sharp and see that it's just going to be E to E to be a perfect octave. And last example in minor, let's do a minor sixth. And the root note will be C sharp. So C sharp minor has the signature of four sharps. And we can see that uh, minor sixth above so 6 is going to be some kind of A, and in this case we see it's not affected by anything in the key signature. So a minor 6th above C sharp is A natural. Okay, for our second example set, we can look at some notes that don't conveniently fall uh, on a major or minor scale. So what if we wanted a major 2nd above the note C flat? So we want a major second above. Of course, maybe we could use C flat major and draw all the flats, but why not just make it a C natural? And then we know that in C major, the D is a major second. And now we need to get it back to C flat. So we add the flat back to the C and the corresponding flat to the D. And we know that <clears throat> a major second above C flat is D flat. And in a minor key, let's look at <clears throat> how about a hmm, how about an E sharp. So we want a minor third. <clears throat> above E sharp. So let's go ahead and make this an E natural and then think about being an E minor. So that would give us one sharp and the minor third would be G of course. And now we have lowered this so we need to raise it back to E sharp. So when we add a sharp to E we also need to add, we need to raise a G which makes it a G sharp. So we see that a minor third above E sharp is G sharp. <clears throat> and now we can do some practice with perfect intervals. So we can write a series of fifths and octaves and fourths. And now we can go through and 
check these and see if they're perfect or diminished or augmented. And maybe I'll add a few accidentals as well. OK. So the first one is an F to a C. So taking the root note, <coughs> we can think of being either F major or F minor. I'll say F minor just for fun, or F major. So that gives us one flat. And the C is not being affected by the key signature. So we see that this is, in fact, a perfect fifth. And this octave, of course, E to E, uh, doesn't have any alterations. So we see that it's a perfect octave. OK, and then G to C sharp. So we know automatically that this is going to be some sort of fourth. So now how do we find out if it's perfect or diminished or augmented? So let's take G as our root note and say we're in G major, which gives us a key signature of one sharp, F sharp. So knowing that lets us know that if we wanted a perfect fourth, it would just be a G to a C, since the only thing in the signature is an F sharp. So this is a C sharp, which going back to our chart, we know that perfect interval when it's raised is augmented and when it's lowered is diminished. So we see that this is raised from what it would naturally be in G major. So we can call this an augmented fourth. <coughs> so second example, similarly with some accidentals, A flat. So we can think about being an A flat major, which we know has four flats, B flat, E flat, here's the A flat and D flat. And the question was asking for the interval between A flat and D. So we know it's some kind of fourth. And we see here that in A flat major, the D would normally be a D flat to give us the perfect fourth. So we are raising the perfect fourth by making a flat a natural. So this is going to be another augmented fourth. <coughs> This next fourth is using B as the root note. And so we'll make a key signature of, let's use B minor, just for less sharps. So we know B minor has two sharps, F sharp and C sharp. And we see here that this note E is within that scale. So we know it's a perfect fourth. And the last example is an F to a B. So let's go ahead and check this with F major. So the F major key signature, as we saw back here, is one flat. So we see that, in fact, what the question is asking for is different from what's in the F major key signature. So since we're taking this note that would normally be perfect as a B flat and making it a B natural, we see again that this fourth is augmented. And now just for further practice, let's uh, invert some of these intervals and see what happens. So here we have this F to C fifth. And I'll go ahead and take the C down an octave. And according to our inversion chart, which I'll write here again, We see that this perfect fifth, oh, and here's the major to minor, minor to major, perfect to perfect, diminished to augmented, augmented to diminished. So we see that according to our chart, we know that this was a perfect fifth. So this has to be some kind of fourth. And since it was perfect, it stays perfect. And this octave we see here becomes these two E's. And so we know that an octave inverts to a unison. So, and it was perfect before, so when it's inverted, it stays perfect. And the next one, this augmented fourth that we had up here, the G to the C sharp. So we'll take the G and move it up an octave. So it's a fourth. So we see that a fourth inverts to a fifth. And if we weren't sure about that, of course, we can always just count the, inter uh, the notes up. So one, two, three, four, five. And an aug augmented interval will invert to become diminished. So this is now 
a diminished fifth. And same thing happens with the next one, which was an A flat to a D becoming a D to an A flat. So this is again a diminished fifth. And the next two are what we've seen already, perfect fourths and augmented fourths. So of course, they will again invert to a perfect fifth and a diminished fifth for the fourth. And for our fourth example, let's do a little bit more work with inversions. So let's take some intervals like this. And we can just draw in some random notes, F to B flat, C sharp to F, and A flat to E. <clears throat> so, if we had previously figured out that this is a minor seventh, this is a perfect fourth, this is a diminished fourth, and this is an augmented fifth, <clears throat> and we can make our little chart again, which is really handy. And the qualities, diminished to augmented, major to minor, minor to major, perfect to perfect, and augmented to diminished. So we see that writing this minor seventh inverted gives us a D to this E. And so it's going to be some kind of second. And minor inverts to major, so it's a major second. And if we wanted to check that, of course, there's many ways we can do it now that we've learned. The easiest would be to think about a D major scale and whether or not E is an altered note in D major. And of course, it's not because the key signature is F sharp and C sharp. OK, and the next one, perfect fourth. So I'll take the F and move it up an octave. And we see from our chart that a fourth inverts to a fifth, which this is. And perfect stays perfect, so perfect fifth. And this diminished fourth here, this time I'll move the top note. So C sharp down to F. And so we know that fourth inverts to a fifth, and diminished inverts to augmented. So of course, this F to this C sharp is an augmented fifth. and the last interval is an augmented fifth. <clears throat> and we see that inverting it gives us an E to an A flat, which is, of course, some kind of fourth and turns out to be a diminished fourth, according to the chart. OK, that's it for this lesson on intervals.